In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, I was traveling through the Diocese of Peoria, and I decided to stop by the cathedral there because I knew the body of Fulton Sheen would be there. And so I managed to uh, get into the cathedral uh, early that morning, and I was praying before the body of Fulton Sheen, and I was sort of inspired, sort of moved at that time to listen to some of his talks. I had several of those talks available, and I wanted to hear one that I hadn't heard before. And so I went in search of something that I hadn't listened to yet, and I found a series of talks that he had given all the way back in 1943. And keep in mind, this is all the way back in the 1940s. And he was talking about the fall of Rome versus modern society. And this one particular quote that he said stood out to me. He said, the difference between that crisis, meaning the fall of Rome, the difference between that crisis and ours is that in the case of Rome, a material civilization was collapsing and a spiritual one about to emerge. In the present instance, it is the spiritual which is being submerged, and the material which is in its ascendancy. I found these words to be particularly relevant for us today. The idea of, we could argue, the prevailing issue of our day is materialism. We could also call that worldliness and the hypocrisy that comes from that, right? When we claim to be spiritual, we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, but at the same time, completely consumed with worldliness. I remember once I was, I was talking to an elderly priest, I was visiting this elderly priest in a nursing home, and he told me that back in the 40s and 50s, whenever they were doing ministry, oftentimes they would go door to door and knock on people's doors and evangelize that way. And he said it wasn't because of, you know, any saintliness or zeal, he was a very humble man, is it wasn't because of any saintliness or zeal, it's because we had nothing else to do, right? We were simply bored. But I was actually kind of envious of this, right? You know, the, the fact that there weren't all of these distractions, there weren't all of these things that derailed the ministry, derailed that work for God. Several years ago, I had the privilege of hearing a lecture from Dr. Peter Kraft. And Dr. Kraft is a, or was, a professor at Loyola University. And he gave this, uh, this lecture, he titled it, How to Win the Culture War. How to Win the Culture War. And the, the points that he made, I actually found rather surprising, right? I, I thought he was going to talk about conservatism and, and how to, uh, Uh, you know, accept the truth and all of these things. And he didn't go in the direction that I was expecting. He actually said, in order to win the culture war, there are three things that have to be in place. Three things that we absolutely have to acknowledge. The first thing is that we are at war, right? That there's a spiritual battle going on. That there's something here that we are fighting for. I don't think I have to convince any of us here that this is the case. A couple of uh, months ago, uh, I was stationed in Green Bay, Wisconsin, out at the Shrine of Our Lady of Good Help for many years. And a couple months ago, I was walking through the, the hallway down near our gift shop there, and I heard two of the employees arguing. And two of the employees were in some kind, at least I thought they were arguing, right? It turns out they weren't. But there was some type of a heated discussion going on. And so I come over and I say, you know, what's going on? And they, they, they start talking about something that's going on in their school, that they, where they send their kids. And they said to me, they said, Father, have you heard about the litter boxes? And I said, what are you talking about? No, I have not heard about the litter boxes. And they said... In their school, their school had decided that in all of the school bathrooms, they were going to put litter boxes in the school for kids who identified as cats. 
They were going to put litter boxes in the school for all of the kids at the school that identified as cats. Now, you and I hear that and we think, that is absolute insanity, right? This is the culture war at its highest. But I realized at that moment, this is man without God, right? This is man without grace. This is man without the influence of sanctifying divine life within his soul. We literally descend into madness. The fathers of the church would, of course, identify this as the madness of sin. This is the war. This is the battle that we are fighting. So that's the first thing. The second thing we all must acknowledge is who is our enemy? Who are we fighting in this war? Because if we don't know who we're fighting, we can't hope to win it. We spend so much of our time fighting each other. It's the liberals who are the problem, right? If we could just overcome the liberals, like if the liberals are saying the same thing about us, the conservatives. But is that really the issue? When in fact, our enemy is the ancient enemy. He's the one whom we've always been fighting, the devil, Satan, and his demons. He is the one that attacks our very soul. The devil knows that he can never defeat God. So he goes after the next best thing. He goes after his image. He goes after us. The devil's sole purpose is to destroy the image of God within us. We spend so much of our time arguing and fighting amongst ourselves that we forget that the spiritual battle, the more important battle of the culture war, is the spiritual battle within. It's the fight against the devil. And we could also argue it's the fight against ourselves. There's nothing worse than becoming the devil ourselves. Fighting that battle from within to overcome fallen human nature. And this, by extension, actually brings us to the third point, to the third thing that must be acknowledged to win this war. What are the weapons that are necessary to defeat our enemy, to defeat the devil? Well, simply put, we find the answer in our gospel today. We find the answer in this passage that we have from Luke's gospel, where our Lord visits the house of Martha and Mary. Right, and you have our Lord, he goes, and Mary comes and she sits at his feet and Martha's doing all of the serving. Martha comes to our Lord and she complains. She says, I love this line in the scripture. Many people actually say this to the Lord, if you, if you notice in scripture. She says to him, Lord, do you not care? She's saying this to Jesus. Do you not care that I'm doing all the serving by myself and Martha, or Mary is not doing anything to help me? It's also reminiscent of when the apostles are in the boat, right? And they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? Often it is that we feel as though our Lord is not paying attention. Is the Lord really interested in our culture war? But notice the Lord's response to Martha. He says to her, Martha, Martha, you are concerned about many things, but there is need of only one thing, and Mary has chosen the better part. Now, the English, we say there is need of only one thing. The Latin gives a little bit more of an insight into what our Lord is actually saying. It's the, the Latin is the unum necessarium, the one thing necessary. Mary has chosen the one thing that is necessary. Notice our Lord doesn't correct Martha for working. He doesn't correct Martha for 
doing this apostolic work, he corrects her for not putting first things first. He corrects her for not putting contemplation above activity. When we think about it, this is the core of the spiritual life. This is the absolute foundation of the spiritual life. That any exterior work that I try to perform, any work, even spiritual work, that I try to complete, if it is not supported by a life of contemplation, in other words, closeness to God, closeness to our Lord Jesus, that work will be fruitless. Remember in the Gospels when our Lord, right after his transfiguration, the Lord comes down the mountain and he's in, entered into the valley. And in that valley, there's a man with a possessed son. The man comes up to the Lord and he says, Lord, your apostles have been trying to drive this demon out and they can't do it. And the Lord sighs from the depths of his being, right? He says, how long must I endure this unfaithful generation, this faithless generation? And he drives the demon out of the man's son. Well, the apostles come to the Lord afterwards and they say, well, why couldn't we do that? Why couldn't we drive him out? And the Lord's answer was very telling. He said, it's because you have no faith. It's because you're not close to God. That's why you're powerless. He says, this type of demon can only be driven out by much prayer and fasting. Only through closeness to God will you find the power of God. We look out in our society today, we see rampant sin. Rampant immorality all around us. Why, ha why are, we, do, are we seemingly unable to drive it out? Is it because we're not close to God? That's exactly what Jesus would say. These types of demons can only be driven out with much prayer and fasting. This is the message of our Lord to Mary. He's telling her, put first things first. In other words, the answer to winning the culture war is to become a saint, to become the saint that God is calling each and every one of us to become. Why is it that whenever we think about that, we think about becoming a saint, we know God is calling us to holiness. We know he's calling us to union with him. We know he's calling us to be a saint. Why is it that our first reaction to that is, well, I could never do that, right? I'm no Mother Teresa. I'm not St. John Vianney. It's because when we get down to it, and this is sort of the frightening reality of it, when I boil it down, I come to face to face to one of our Lord's most important promises in the gospel, which he says, he who seeks finds, knock and the door will be opened to you. So ultimately the reason that I am not a saint is because I don't want to be one yet. Because if I wanted to be a saint, Lord Jesus promised me he would give me the grace to do so. Seek and you will find. Knock and the, and the door will be opened to you. We come to this realization that the culture war, yes, it is certainly something that can help, can assist us on that path to salvation, but it is not the end that we are searching for. A perfect culture will never be in this society. But sanctification, 
my soul becoming a saint, that is possible with the help of God. So I have to ask myself, am I ready, am I willing to make that commitment to God right now? Imagine how different the world would be if everyone here in this little chapel in South Union, Kentucky, if everyone here decided I'm going to become the saint that God wants me to be. Now, the devil, once he was attacking St. John Vianney, he was throwing him around and beating him. And he asked St. John Vianney, he said, do you know why I hate you so much? John Vianney says, no. He says, because if there were one other priest like you living at the same time, my kingdom would be overthrown. If there were but one other priest like you living at the same time, my kingdom would be overthrown. Two saints. Saint, two St. John Vianney's would overthrow the kingdom of the devil here on earth. Imagine how differently the world would look if 12 more people, even 12 more disciples here today were to decide, I'm going to become the saint God wants me to be. How much more different would our culture look? Would the war take a turn in favor of truth? So I call on all of us to ask our Lord to give us the grace to want, to want to become a saint. Let's just start there. Lord, teach me to want to want it. Teach me to love. That's what I think the apostles were saying when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to love. Teach us to, to learn how to want these things authentically and to live the life you're calling us to. The path to true sanctification, to really becoming a, state, a saint, starts with repentance. It starts with turning to God and asking for that grace. I'd like to close with one more quote from Fulton Sheen from that same talk from 1943. He says, Our exterior world today is in desperate straits. But the inner world of man is far from hopeless. The world is far from God, but human hearts are not. That is why peace will come less from political changes than from man himself, who, driven to take refuge within his own soul from the turmoil without. How do we win the culture war? We turn to God and we ask him, Lord, teach me to love you. Teach me to be the saint you're calling me to be. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.